Uh, welcome to Dr. Omandi Show in the KHA TV. And uh, today we're looking at African leadership and the two countries, the country of Ghana and Equatorial Guinea. As we continue to unravel the uh, about the two countries. Now, briefly, I want to look at the country of Ghana. The country of Ghana is in the West Africa region and is uh, bounded by um, uh, the country of Togo to the east, uh, Cote d'Ivoire to the west, and the Burkina Faso uh, to the north, west, and north. So, um, a brief history about this country is a um, simple timeline of the country of Ghana and because we are looking at leadership but this is the timeline we want to give a brief. 1957 Ghana attained independence uh, with the first Prime Minister uh, uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. 1960 Ghana became a republic and uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah became the president. 1964 Nkrumah made Ghana a one-party state uh, which he was favoring his own ruling party CPP and in 1966 a coup military coup removed Nkrumah and ushered in International Liberation Council which suspended the constitution now 1969 a new constitution was put in place and the election was done that year so the military took over uh, he changed the constitution and brought in the civilian government and Dr. Kofi Posia was elected the premier of Progressive Party. 1972, they, another coup happened. Colonel Ignazio Zachipong, the National Redemption Party, became to power. Then, uh, in 1978, uh, Zachipong was also overthrown by General Frederick Akufo and then they put a new constitution in 1979 another military coup took place uh, by flight J Jerry Roaring who paved way for an honest election at that time they were planning for an election and the Jerry Roaring uh, they thought that it was going to be crooked so what they did is that they took over, but in two weeks time there was election coming up, which they they allowed it to take place, and Dr. Hila Liman of People's National Party was elected president. Huh. But in 1981, another military coup uh, ushering in Jerry Rawlings to power, who suspended the constitution. He did not call it the coup; he called it the revolution. So. That is now, uh, he ruled from 1981 to 1992. And Jerry Roaring ruled with the, the Provisional National Defense Council. And they transitioned that to civilian rule under a new constitution. This is now the Fourth Republic of Ghana, but this is an, a new constitution again was formed. So 1992 election was done. Uh, Jerry Rowling was elected president by 58% and in 1996 he was re-elected so he completed his full term uh, as uh, a civil uh, president elected now <coughs> now that is the timeline uh, of all the uh, the, the, the people who, who, who took over but after that Jerry Rowling was retiring because the constitution required only two terms <coughs> now in december 2000 presidential election for the first time in ghana's history there was a democratic transfer of power after the national democratic congress candidate vice president john Atta mills was defeated in the second round of presidential contest by new patriotic party leader john kofo so the NDP, npp also won the parliamentary elections held on the same day in that year as the first round of presidential election. So, in 2004, John Kofor 
was re-erected. And in 2008, Atta Mills uh, defeated the incumbent uh, Vice President Nana Ado uh, to take over the leadership. President Atta Mills died on the year 2012 when he was serving his second term. When the election was supposed to be in December, he died. So President John Draman Mahama was sworn in. And after that, the coming election, John Mahama won. And uh, 2016, when he was seeking the election, he was defeated by uh, NPP's candidate Akufo Addo. So he lost the election, he was not re-elected. So, that is where we are now in 2016. So from 2016, Akufo is the, is the president. Now, and I, when I wanted us to discuss, uh, to discuss about Ghana, and I wanted to pick two people who, the leaders who I don't shaped Ghana where it is right now. And I will go to the first president, Kwame Nkrumah, and also, I will discuss about Jerry Rawlings as the people, as the leaders who shaped uh, the political leadership of Ghana. Now, Nkwame Nkrumah was voted in 1999, BBC's African Focus voted him as the African Man of the Millennium. In 2004, New Africa, he was voted as the number two true son of Africa after Nelson Mandela. So, he is a very popular name in Africa. Kwame Nkrumah was the first person who became a president of an independent state in Africa. Ghana was the first country to attain independence in 1957. So he inspired so many leaders in Africa who to agitate for independence. And actually, Kwame Nkrumah had a big vision for Africa. He wanted Africa, a United States of Africa, where all countries in Africa, once they get independence, they come together, they form one country called Africa, United States of Africa. So he was the founder of Pan Africans. He initiated a lot of development projects in Ghana. However, as many as his, um, Charles Ab Abugri, says that dead politicians are different things to th different people. Both their good and their wrong divine the, the goalposts. And hence, the playing fields upon which the survivors take their position in society. Their good is usurped, their failures are exhumed and magnified appropriately and in accordance with creed. It is in the nature of humanity to review the past, for in doing so, we not only divine our own essence, but also seek to learn lessons if we genuinely desire to do so. That is very important. Politicians, political leaders at times, victims and beneficiaries remember both. It is the balance between the two. So when, when a leader is in power, he creates enemies and friends too friends who benefit so they would always say a leader is good and those who were victimized who thought they were victimized they did not get favorism they feel um the the those were bad achievements so the balance between the two is what we are looking at as Shakespeare says too the evil that men do lives after them but the good is entirely with their bones well, I don't know whether that is that is very true, but we want to be very objective and discuss about uh, um, Kwame Nkrumah, the son of Africa. Uh, there is always ambivalent reasons to feel what, um, why, as the first person to be the president in Africa was toppled. In quoting, in paraphrasing what uh, Ari Mazurui said, by a strange of twist of destiny, Nkwame Nkrumah Bugana was both the hero who carried the torch of Pan-Africanism and the villain who started the old legacy of one party state in Africa. To that extent, Nkwame Nkrumah started the old traditional black authoritarianism in the post-colonial era 
he was the villain of peace is that I, I think that was Ali Manzuri tried to summarize this uh, in a very uh, objective way which I, I, I would suppose we will look at this together so in line with what uh, 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 Ali Manzuri said let us look at Ghana as we have said that uh, in Kwame Nkrumah is his positive as the father of Pan-Africans but did he really start uh, black authoritarianism as, uh, as Harry Manzuri means let us look at this history after becoming uh, after independence of Ghana in 1959 Kwame Nkrumah introduced the Prevention Detention Act PDA detention without trial has treatment of opponents held others who died there including Dankwa. Dankwa was the founder of UGCC, the first party, which actually called him to come to be a secretary from UK. He imprisoned him because he differed in, in his ideology. He declared a one-party state and made himself president for life. That is in Kwame Nkrumah, the man who is revered in Africa, but that is the truth that he declared Ghana, he, he got Ghana, the, the first in the uh, uh, constitution of Ghana at independence, Ghana was a multi-party state. He had so many economic blunders that uh, affected the economy. Brit the British, when they left, left a lot of money in the treasury because of the money they had, the revenue they had got from the, uh, the taxes, they were taxing cocoa, cocoa prices were very high, so the country made a lot of money at that time. He even purchased planes for for the airways of Ghana from Soviet Union, which had a very bad contract. Those planes had to be serviced in Moscow. That when a, a plane is servicing does go to Moscow, there were not many people going to Russia at that time. So the planes were going to be serviced to Moscow empty without people. There was rampant corruption in his in, in his government. Um, like one minister's wife had ordered a bed for 500 US uh, UK pounds 5,000 UK pounds a bed at that time in the 60s that was a lot of money so really um, he was really he's the one who started and that's the reason why he was overthrown because of uh, his dictatorship they, they, he did not live with friends and that's the reason so he was overthrown but and one thing we have to give accolade to all military rulers who took over most of the military uh, rulers not many people died and actually all of those military rulers they took over but they were working on their way to taking the government back to Syria that is the difference between the military coup in Ghana. The leaders all wanted to take back the country to civilian rule. Not like other despots like Mobutu Saseko. So we can give them accolades that even if there were coups in, in, in Ghana, those were great leaders because all of them aspired to take the country back to the civilian rule. And then we look at Jerry Rawlings. Jerry Rawlings did not have ambition to become president. He was accused by the military council, he was tried, and he was supposed to be executed. While awaiting execution, the only words he said, he said something which inspired uh, people at execution. He said he would die, but he wanted them to live with his friends, and that the only thing he was asking was food, not anything else. So, when he took over first, he allowed the, the election which was already planned to go on. The president was elected. He gave the president who was elected to rule. But he told him that you have to be effective. You have to implement this. So when he saw that he was not actually implementing that, what he did, he went back again. And then the people demanded him to come back. He took, when in his long military rule from 1982 to 1992, 
He did a lot of things to Ghana. He achieved political stability and economic stability in a region which was rife. That is something he did. And what he did as a military ruler, he created a devolved system of government. He said that in this, the people have to make decisions. So it was not more actually a military rule because he created 110 districts through a non-partisan district level elections. So education, infrastructure, development and healthcare all devolved to the district level. And there were district assemblies, the best developed system of government that the people or annual government subvention by law goes to the district. It, this is something not very possible in Africa. Actually, he did many things. Even he built the first ever memorial uh, to Nkwame Nkrumah and the uh, W.G. Du Bois, the, the founders of independence in Ghana. And actually went back, followed the independence foreign policy. He returned to Ghana to the democratic rule in 1992 after a public referendum by a wide majority approved a new constitution. Very rare in Africa <laughs> to have such. And actually, even past the Ghana Education Trust Fund, that is today educating millions of Ghanaians. Very, very quite interesting. Expanded their access to northern parts of Ghana, uh, which were ignored by the elites. So, and through this, he actually contributed immensely. Uh, and he had um, put so many agri good aggressive policies. So Jerry Rawlings, Three times he handed power peacefully. The first time when he, he took the military over, he took it back to the civilian. Then the second time when he ruled, he, he again did he again did that in 1992, and he was he went to civilian. He was re-elected twice. After that, the opponent his opponent took over, and he handed over power. And that is the prosperity has brought in the Forty Republic of Ghana. We have had a very peaceful transfer, democratic transfer of power in Ghana. So the two leaders, you can see the choices that the leaders made in Africa. So Nkuruma made wrong decision. I mean, he had good plans, he had good plans for the country, he had started so many infrastructure. But we can see that the Hawaii, good African leaders, and we have to emulate, even though Jerry Rawlings has his own shortcomings because when he came to power, he executed some politicians, even in some former head of state who were found to be corrupt. And uh, well, but at times it's a good example which needs to be followed in Africa. He took that because he was fighting for injustice. Actually, he himself was calling himself an advocate of the poor. When they complain about uh, his uh, government of issue being corrupt, he would act. When they were doing some injustice, he would act. If they were incapable of doing something, he would act. So he really proved to be a great leader who did good for his country. And these are the, some of the best practices that we need to follow. That Jerry Rowling is one person whose leadership needs to be emulated in Africa. A truly effective leadership in a country which was turmoil and is actually we created him for bringing peace in that country so let us now jump to the country of equatorial guinea <laughs> equatorial guinea is located in the west coast of africa just 2000 uh, 20,000 kilometers square it's not a big country with a, a population roughly of 1.3 million that is a very small population. It consists of, uh, of an island of Bioko, where the capital Malabo is located, and uh, Anobi. Then there is a mainland which is called Yomuni. It borders Cameroon to the north and Gabon to the south and east. You can see in the map, that's a small country. So the island of Malabo is above the equator and uh, then uh, the mainland. So they are together to form the country of Equatorial Guinea. It is one of Africa's largest producers of oil since 1995. 
gained independence from Spain in 12 October 1968, and Francisco Macias Nguema became the first president. So the first president, Macias Nguema, who is also who renamed himself as Macias Nguema Biyogo Masi, he was son of a witch doctor. He saw his father killed by a Spanish colonial administrator. So in 1968, he became the Prime Minister, and after his election in 1971, he assumed white powers, pushed through a constitution that named him president for life <laughs> in July 1972. He assumed absolute personal power in 1973, and uh, the island of Fernandobo was renamed Marcias Nguema Biyogo Island in his honor. A true dictator. He controlled the radio and the press. And the foreign travel was stopped. So people from Equatorial Guinea were not traveling outside. In 1975-1977, there were many arrests and summary executions which brought protests from world leaders. Actually, one of the tribes suffered immensely, which he thought they were against him. The Human Rights Organization and Amnesty International you, uh, were condemning his acts. During this period, there was a mass exodus of citizens. From Equatorial Guinea, even the Nigerian government repatriated the nationals who had been working there as laborers. That is who Masia Singwema was. He became a dictator. Masia Singwema was overthrown in 1979 by his nephew, Lieutenant Colonel Teotoro Obiang Ngwema Mbasoko. He was executed, even when he, he resisted, but when he was caught, he was tried by the Supreme Minute Council, and then he was condemned to be executed. Not even the soldiers of Equatoria Guinea would do it. They feared him because they feared he was a witch doctor, he would be with them. They had to call machineries from Morocco to come and execute um, uh, Marcius Wema. Now, now ushering in his nephew. So the other, eh? uh, uh, he ruled with this Supreme Military Council. A Aristotelian constitution was instituted in 1982, followed by the election of 41 and opposed candidates to the legislature. In 1991, he also put a new constitution which allowed for multi-party uh, elections and it led to the first multi-party election held in 1992. There was actually no indication that Obiang was willingly giving up power. Obiang became a dictator. He oppressed the press and actually the opposition suffered greatly. So he always won election work have been conducted in that country but they, they are not free and fair. So he has been uh, accused that he is using the oil uh, revenues to enrich his, himself and his friends. Or being, uh, or even if he has been claiming that uh, people have been trying to overthrow him, he has been a dictator. Or being has been a, a dictator for many years. And uh, in 2012, Obiang appointed one of his sons, Diodori Nguema Obianga Mangwe, as a second vice president, a position that was not provided in the constitution. So he, 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 he assumed that he wants to leave the city to his son. So, and in 2016, after the presidential election, uh, Obiang. Obiang was re-elected with a very big margin, 93.7%, that is abnormal. Even in any democracy, we have never seen that, debating six candidates. And he named his son the first vice president. So, this first, his son, is even facing charges in, 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 in Western countries, like in the US, in, in France. So these are the two countries. We have looked at the two countries, and you have seen choices we make. The country of uh, of, of Equatorial Guinea 
it has oil reserves. He has tried to build, uh, I mean, I don't want to be mean, Obiang has tried to build in the infrastructure, there are highways, best highways in, in, in Equatorial Guinea. He has built many houses, but the people are still poor. If you go there, you will pass a four-lane highway where you are the only one there. There is no vehicles because the people are poor. They can't afford the vehicles. So if you could have used the oil reserves to enrich, to create a middle class in that country to uplift the people, 1.3 million with all the oil reserves, I mean, you could have really made uh, that country rich. So, but he has made a choice of only enriching himself. So you have seen the, the choices of the leaders, some who want to take things to the people and those who want to take things to themselves. Now, what do we consider as African leadership? We can learn good lessons from those who do well and we can run away from bad lessons from some of these leaders that who want to feel Equatorial Guinea has only had people from the same family ruling. So really, if we have to look, is like, why would organization like African Union keep quiet? As much as they don't want to interfere, something need to be done if really these countries have to be uplifted. So when we look this and look at the Ibrahim Mo, we can see that Ibrahim Mo has put Ghana as number five, as a best country. And you can see Equatorial Guinea, the number it has, uh, number 42. So really, uh, that is something we need to look at that to see what African leadership is and what needs to be done. Thank you for listening.